Thank you. I enjoy that. How would George Kittle describe George Kittle? How would George Kittle describe George Kittle? Yep. <laughs> um, goofy with a little bit of chaos. I think it's the best way to describe me. But I like to have a good time. Very happy. Very happy boy and wanted to have fun. And George, in most of his interviews, always uses the word fun many times in every interview. But it's really truly how he lived his little life. He was just a really happy, really easygoing, calm, uh, but and loved being with his, playing with his sister, being with his sister when he was young. He was a very easy kid. Both our kids were real easy for us. So, um, yeah, no big tantrums or any of that kind of stuff. And pretty compliant when we needed him to, but for the most part, we were about exploring. We homeschooled for a long time, and so, you know, tried to live out in the country quite a bit, different stages. Um, so we tried to give him some freedom to do things, had animals around and doing all that. So it was kind of trying to teach them to see the world as a place to explore. That was an adventure and uh, to kind of keep that and to make sure you're having fun because life should be kind of fun. So sometimes we make it a, a kind of drudgery and so there's no need for that. So, and I think a little bit that's kind of spilled off into the way we've always talked about sports should always be fun. So, um, and in fact, the, the higher the level of the competition, the better it is to uh, take a step back, breathe, and just remember it's a game and have fun. So seems to have spilled over pretty well, but he was great that way as a kid. Like people only know George as the size and the attitude and the swag that he has now, but I feel like I just see him still as my little brother. I remember my memories, I mean, obviously like we played and did a lot of things, but my memories of it are, we would always take road trips as a family. And so they would always put us in the, before, or what did we have that? Like a big white suburban. And so we would stop at rest stops and we would just be so pent up and have so much energy. And I just remember running routes and pretty, I mean, it was probably looked like they were just putting us through sprint drills at the time, but we had a football in our hands. But yeah, I mean, it was great because it was my little brother and to compete with your sibling was so much fun. Um, I remember, kind of rubbing it in his face. Um, I always had a lot of fun doing it. And I think it was fun because I wasn't like a little girl who was thinking I was gonna go to the NFL and I wanted to play football, but I loved playing because they loved it so much. And so I loved being able to not only be a part of it, but to be really good at it. Um, and so I liked being able to compete and to be better than him. But I don't ever remember us getting mad at each other. It was just so much fun to play and to be out there. But I mean, obviously I had a great time because I was winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, probably up until, wow. Probably like up until fifth grade, she probably wh wh whooped up on me. She was super athletic. She was way more athletic than me when I was a kid. It's not fair. She also played post in like high school. Like she was, she was, she was a Banff. I mean, most of my life was sports, um, especially for my family. Um, my mom and my dad, uh, they coached every sport I played in up until, I'm pretty sure, like high school. Uh, my parents did my t-ball team, my dad and my friend's dad did our traveling baseball team, my dad did my soccer team, traveling basketball team, about everything. Um, so sports were a massive part of our lives. I mean, we used to go on tournaments for my sister's AAU basketball tournaments, stuff like that. So, I mean, the majority of my life was just sports growing up. Well, I come from a, quite a history of, you know, athletes, our family, we, it was family and sports. That was my childhood. And my mom and dad both played. My dad played football and basketball. My mom played basketball. I mean, my childhood was either playing outside or going to games to watch my older sisters play. And then when I was a senior, um, it was great because I actually played with my sisters on all teams from softball, you know, ran track and then um, basketball. And then my senior year, um, we didn't have video, you know, we were talking about, you know, video. There was not, I mean, I think I had to go to another school to see if we could get video of me when I was in high school playing just, you know, just, and anyhow, but I was, ended up, uh, went to Drake. Uh, a lot of people say, why didn't you go, to, sorry, to the University of Iowa? And at the time they weren't that strong in women's basketball. And so I went to Drake and my senior year, we were in the, the Elite Eight. So we were one game away from the Final Four. And in Iowa, you know, we played in my time, frame, we played the six on six. So you only played really half court. It was like, you know, three guards, three forwards, three guards, three forwards on opposite. And a very different game. You know, you were limited to two dribbles. But anyhow, I went on and played, um, made that transition, which was hard for me to continue dribbling. But played basketball at Drake uh, for four years and also softball. And, um, and then it, they did have a women's league. And so, but then it was bankrupt, so I never really got on to play. Fortunately, women are able to do that now, but at my time, it wasn't. 
available. I mean, now that I'm, I can't remember, what is, what are the tryouts before the, what they were called before the Olympics? Well, they didn't say, call it World Championship, but it was at Knoxville, Tennessee, that's when Pat um, Summit was there, and, uh, but they had the tryouts there, and I made it through three cuts. So, but I was so nervous, and, you know, I just couldn't relax. I was just, you know, really nervous. I was a freshman. I not, this was the first time I'd ever played five player basketball. You know, we'd always played, you know, like I said, six on six, but it was quite, a, you know, it was quite an experience. Um, I think, you know, I had to do it over again. I would have made the team. <laughs> For certain. <laughs> she left out though too. She's one of, I think there's only, at the time there was only five or six, but she's one of a handful of women in the history of Iowa high school athletics to be inducted into two separate Hall of Fames. Yeah. So she's so. in the Hall of Fame in basketball and in softball. <laughs> Anyhow, times are a little different, you know, for the she opportunities. Batted, she batted over 400 all four years of high school. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's true. I'm just, uh, hey. It so, ain't, it ain't bragging. I just want to know it. where George got his athleticism. <laughs> there you go. That's what everybody says. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah, I mean, it's been everything to us. Sports has always been a huge part of our lives. It's never really felt like it was just sports, though, because we were raised playing. George and I were raised outside, so a lot of times we're either on a farm or doing something together. But once it became time for us to play sports. I mean, our parents were such a big part of it and they were always our coaches. So it, I mean, we were just always together. So it just seemed like another thing for us to do and a way to burn off energy and compete and have fun. And since we had so many cousins, it was, yeah, it was just such a natural progression. Well, I come from a really large family. I have nine sisters. And so I grew up with my mom and dad on a farm and family was so important. And um, then I had, you know, cousins and whatever, but it usually was, our core family, and now we're 128 of just that from my sisters. On the, and so we moved away and we came back to Iowa to be with family because I wanted our children to have the childhood I did. So, yeah, family has always been so important. Uh, well, I don't know how everybody else's families are and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I just, as we grew up, uh, had the kids, um, and partly part of it comes from um, I've always enjoyed being a dad more than any other job I've ever had. So um, early on, uh, both of us, and she was primarily stay at home, you know, in the early days. Uh, and they really were the center of our worlds. And we tried to make them feel as special as we could and nurture them and love them. And I guess as they grew up, we haven't changed too much of that. And so uh, the four of us, um, and now George is married with Claire, so that all seems to work out pretty good for us. So um, tried to help him to understand the importance of relationships and staying connected. Um, and if you're doing all those things and the rest of your house is in order, then all the money stuff kind of tends to take care of itself. Yeah, so we all have a bear paw tattoo. Um, I love tattoos, <laughs> and so it was really fun when everybody started getting on board and getting them. Then my dad got the first bear paw tattoo, and it's four going up his ankle, um, so one for each of us. And then George got his big one on his bicep. Mine's on the back of my arm, and then my mom's is on the back of her ankle. It's family and it's our tribe and I think Claire's gonna get one soon. We keep bothering her about it. Um, but it's cool because the other thing about it like in animal medicine is um, the way my mom's birthday lines up, she is a bear. And so to think about it as like a mother bear and how, I like to think of it as like my dad found this very powerful mother bear, you know, and then through that created and has nurtured and, you know, created the tribe that we are now. And so it's really special. Well, the, so the bear, I'm kind of a spirit person, so all that kind of stuff. So I'm a little bit in the indigenous world. So kind of the animal totems is kind of spirit guides and that kind of piece. So um, not officially designated, but the, the bear for us has always kind of had certain symbolic meaning, um, all kinds of things to that. But anyway, so it was a totem for that. So early on in one, actually one of our climbs of a 14er when we were out in Colorado, um, got the four bear paws on the back of my leg and kind of just a representation, one bear paw claw for each one of us. Uh, so there was a small one for George and then one was a little bigger for Emma and then a little bigger for her and then I had the big fat one for me. So, uh, but just uh, that piece of that and I think um, as we've kind of talked with them and staying connected, that's kind of the part of that family bond a little bit. So kind of the, uh, the bear and the bear claw being kind of representative of our family crest, I guess a little bit, unofficially of course, but a little bit just the values of that and staying connected with that. Yeah, so the bear totem itself, so uh, it's, 
kind of one of the primary dominant forces, obviously, in the forest or in its environmental setting, uh, kind of a leader in that regard and that kind of piece. Um, some of the other pieces, the hibernation piece is a reminder to us that we each need some time away to take pause from the things that we do. Uh, we overeat at times and then other times need to starve. And so there's some of those kind of pieces. Uh, but the bear, I think, it, the core values are about kind of integrity and honesty and those kind of pieces that it represents. Uh, and trying to, I think, hopefully idealize some of those pieces within our own lives as well. My dad is always 120% invested in anything that he does. So, uh, I mean, it kind of rubbed off on me. So it, uh, I definitely appreciated it every single day. <laughs> he was great. Um, uh, that's, yeah, I mean, I got to start tackle football, I think, in fifth grade. Um, yeah, fifth and sixth grade, he was my coach. Seventh and eighth grade, we went undefeated. That was pretty fun for him. Uh, I think we gave up 12 points in two years on defense. It's not bad. Uh, he had our, uh, my eighth grade year, he had our Mike linebacker. He had one of the QB wristband tapes so he could uh, call plays out and call blitzes out from the sideline and our linebacker could just read it. It's pretty, he was intense. We had a whole playbook and everything. It was awesome. Yeah, primarily just he, at that time, he really wasn't real long at that time. He was kind of, he looked at because he was kind of skinny, but he was really twitchy and just had a really natural feel for um, avoiding people. So we would just, we only had like three plays on offense, you know, and maybe one or two passes and basically either a sweep or a straight ISO. And we just pitched in the ball, he'd run around the edge and sometimes we blocked people, sometimes we didn't. And he just would juke a couple guys and run down the sideline. And that was kind of our offense. I mean, and so we'd do that two or three times and get up by two or three touchdowns and then we'd give it the ball to somebody else and do other things with it. So, and I don't know exactly where all that came from, you know what I mean? But I just, he was a little bit ahead of the age group, the guys he was playing. And George later went through that stage. I mean, kind of ninth and 10th, he was that kind of gangly looking young deer look, you know, real elbows and knees. And he wasn't as twitchy compared to some of his colleagues, but in the early years he was until he really went through some growth spurts. So uh, those early years up through seventh and eighth grade, he could juke with the best of them and outrun all about everybody. So that was really fun back then. It was just super easy. And then he played safety. And I guess I just, this is George. We were playing a team, and really our tribals from Cedar Rapids, you know, not very favored, and I won't go into any details, but, and they came down just in, you know, it was a private school, and they were gonna just whoop us, and they had their chartered bus, and all this kind of stuff, and we just smoked them. I think we were up like, I wanna say it was like 38 to zero. Um, we were crushing them. Anyway, at the end of the game, we're just trying to run, let them, they got the ball, Coach could run the ball, but he's still throwing them, even though they're way down. So I just have George at safety, because he goes, Dad, we're not gonna let him score. And I would, almost took him out and I said, okay, because the guys, they, it was a big deal by then because it was like late in the season. And they threw the ball and I knew right away he was going to pick it off. And so he just slides over, jumps in front of the receiver and uh, picks it off. And then I'm like, he's going to run it back. And there's only like 10 seconds left in the game. We're already up by whatever. And I, they're already mad at us. And he just scoots right down the sideline, jukes two or three guys, goes 60 yards for a touchdown, almost the last play of the game. Ran it back like 70 yards for a touchdown. It was pretty fun. He told me to go down, and I was like, nah, no chance. It was too much fun. Head coach wouldn't shake my hand after the game. And I said, This is eighth grade. Eighth grade. And I said, George, I told you we didn't want to score again. He goes, Dad, if they're going to throw it, then they, sh they should have run the ball then. And I said, OK, I go, whatever. But he was just adamant. He goes, no, I'm not, I'm not taking a knee on that one. If they're going to throw it at us, we're going to go back. I said, OK, all right, so he did. But anyway, that was just, he was very competitive by then already. So I am the assistant strength coach at Lipscomb Academy. And so it's been this incredible opportunity for me to be around football in a, a more learning and development phase. And so I have learned so much about football and how much goes into it through that in a way that I did not appreciate it before. And I think it's really interesting because as I'm around high school players um, who are about to be, you know, who are in such a transitional phase from going, you know, from earning their spot to going into college and then, you know, looking ahead, um, I hear a lot of people say, like, they don't have the stuff or they don't, you know, it's this, like, when we look at a player, it's like, do they have it or they don't? And I think what's really interesting is, like, George never had it. You know, and, like, we will always say that we saw that and we knew that he was athletic and that he was special and that he was passionate. But like when people looked at him, he was just this skinny white kid out of Oklahoma who didn't mean anything. It's kind of one of those things if, uh, if you don't enjoy the grind and you don't take pride in it, uh, you'll never be good at it and you're just gonna kind of hate your life. So it's just one of those things you just kind of, kind of accept it and say, I'm gonna get better at it and I'm gonna enjoy doing it. I mean, playing in the league is a big deal. I mean, I mean 
I mean, I'm not saying that just because George is in it, but I mean, just being around football as long as I have, I've all these very, very good players who go and try to play in the league and you might make it a year or two, or a lot of guys don't. And so I have a great respect and appreciation. Um, I mean, playing in the NFL is really difficult. And, um, and actually being on this side of it, I, I mean, I've known some players that I've coached uh, when I was at Oklahoma and that, and I knew some guys and all that, and then even guys I played with. Um, until you really get that personal side of it, people don't appreciate the grind and the physical wear and tear, the mental side of it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, from George's, you know, being a fifth round draft choice, I mean, didn't know if he's going to get drafted, then he does get drafted and then not sure if he's going to make the cut. And then he not only makes the cut, they trade Vance McDonald and he's the starter as a rookie. And, it, you know, the whole thing just was kind of mind boggling, honestly. So I certainly have those moments where, and when the New Orleans game, that play, I mean, I'm as big a fan as anybody, so you kind of go back and forth, and you're like, holy cow, I can't believe that happened. I mean, there were other plays too, not just George's, but so I have a great appreciation for the physicality and the athleticism that's demonstrated. I mean, there's unbelievable athletes. I mean, that's really the difference. You know, the defensive guys are so much bigger and so much faster. The windows for passing are so much smaller. The margin of error is so tiny, you know, between winning and losing that way. So I have a great appreciation for that and and really just a respect for it. And so, yeah, I, I do. I go from, you know, proud father, but also just appreciating, you know, and that's what he's talked about is run blocking and that. But I mean, I, we've always, I mean, you can't play tight end at Iowa unless you run block because they don't really throw the ball very much. They do, you know, a little bit more now. But I mean, so you have to do that. And so we've always tried to really stress taking great pride in that. You don't want to be a tight end that just bumps guys. You want to be a guy that dominates people. I mean, that's been our goal ever since he's played football. And if you can do the run game really well and do that, then everything else seems to fall in place. So I do have a great appreciation for that skill set. And when I look out there and he's playing these guys and the defensive ends he plays against and he blocks, and they're phenomenal players. I mean, super great athletes. And they're, you know, 270, 280, 290, you know, they're 4'4 four, four guys. I mean, kind of takes your breath away about some of the stuff. And then being able to watch him play in that arena and then just with the pro football focus stuff, you know, being graded out, I mean, he just graded out the highest level since I've been keeping track of any player that's ever played. I mean, I don't really know what to do with that. You know what I mean? To think that that's my kid and that he's been able to accomplish that. So very proud of him and just, again, just a great level of respect for the NFL and the players and how hard it is for all those guys and all the things that they do. I mean, Bruce will say, Jan, can you you know believe this? And I, I do, I say this, I can believe it. Um, I guess I always saw this little boy who had, and I know so many kids, you know, little girls, little boys, whatever, they have their dreams and you want them to fulfill their dream. But he always said, Mom, I, I'm going to play in the NFL someday. And I said, I believe you. You know, I believe you. And, and so I, I mean, I know Bruce can break it down like he did and talk about the players he is going against. And sometimes that does boggle my mind when I think, you know, who's out there. That, he, that he's on the same team with Richard Sherman is, you know, we, he loved Richard Sherman watching him play. So that is amazing, but I'm, I'm not surprised what he's doing. I, you know, I always believed in him as a little kid and, th and I knew he had, this is what he wanted and um, he works really hard and he's with a great organization and they're giving him opportunities and he's really taking advantage of those opportunities. I mean, I, I will say that New Orleans, that play, I was amazed how he just kept going and going and going, but that's, he has that drive. Uh, before every game, my dad will write George a letter, and this started when I think George was like a sophomore or a freshman in college. Because when you go to college, you know, you don't talk to your parents as much. Um, my dad is definitely my best friend my entire life growing up. Uh, I got to hang out all the time. Like I said, he was my coach and everything that I did. So, you know, we got to interact, hang out. And, you know, when I got to college, the communication, you know, it dies down a little bit because, you know, you're busy all the time. And um, so it, the letters were kind of just a way for him to, you know, talk to me. Um, and I think they started off too, he wasn't sure if I was actually even reading them or anything like that, but you know, there's something that uh, I've kept them all. Um, I still have the ones from college. Uh, they're all in the binder home at home. Uh, all the ones from this year in my backpack, I carry them with me every, everywhere I go. Um, they're just, um, I mean, there's something that mean a lot to me because every single letter is completely unique. Every single letter tells a story. Um, I learn something new from every single letter, whether it's uh, intensity or, um, you know, he just gives me good quotes left and right. Um, I mean, like, for example, you know, after we lost to the Falcons, uh, the next letter was, you know, about the Phoenix rising from the ashes. And that was one of my favorite letters. Um, he always just has a new spin on every single thing and everything ties to something from our relationship. So whether it's a movie, uh, my dad's a big guy in the matrix and, you know, Neo. And, um, so like I get a lot of those quotes. Um, it's just, and a lot of that's about, you know, 
you know, don't have fear, you know, just go you know, out and be you. And so uh, everything that I, you know, the letters are, it's just kind of me and my dad's relationship on a whole. And I get that every single week. So it kind of means the world to me. It all got started basically because there was a player on our team. He was a team captain, a local Oklahoma player, a really good player named Austin Box. Um, and Austin had some chronic back stuff, and he was on painkillers, a little bit kind of the Brett Favre stuff, and nobody really knew about it. Um, and then he was home for kind of a break and overdosed and died with between the painkillers and some alcohol out with some buddies one night. And it was really, really tragic. I mean, just a super high character family, great kid. I mean, just a great kid. Um, and it just really kind of set everybody back. But one of the things that um, as we went through that, there was a little piece at the funeral uh, that his dad w started writing him letters before games. And I kind of found that because that year, that was the first year George was away from us and I was still coaching. And between that, the good news is I knew the video guys at Iowa and because this colleges could communicate, I, they'd send me practice tape and I could watch his film and do all that kind of stuff. But you still don't have the same contact. You're not there and all that. So once I heard that, I just thought that's pretty cool. So then I started writing those letters. I think it was probably his soft, in between his freshman and sophomore year, somewhere in there. So that's how they got started, just as a way to, for me to stay connected to him for us to stay connected to him. And then um, that was part of the motivation. And then also just knowing that I, on a phone call, he wouldn't sit and listen to me enough that for me to share things about that I thought were important. He may not think they were important. So, you know, the freshman year, it's, you know, go to the weight room, study film. You know, that's, that's a developmental deal for you now. You're not going to be a star right now, so don't worry about it. So just getting to buy into the grind, buy into the investing. You know, what matters is where you're at three years from now, you know, that kind of thing. And so um, what I've always tried to do with the letters is try to match where he's at within his career, what's going on, talk about some of those things. We do a little scouting report on the teams he's playing, whatever, that kind of stuff. And when he was in the Big Ten, because I played at Iowa, we had all the same common opponents for the most part, so I could share some stupid stories from stuff that happened to me when I was playing and all that kind of thing. So that was all pretty good. So and then it just kind of kept on. So we went there, we talked about, you know, do you still want me? He goes, yeah, you got to still write me because now it's kind of a part of his game day thing. So I still, so each, I've been writing him as we go. So I've written him every year since. You started handwriting. Yeah, in the first couple of years I did everything by hand. I would handwrite him and then send him up and then all that kind of stuff and then it just got a little complicated when he got to California so um, now we uh, yeah so I do them uh, kind of on the I do them all on computer now and usually a lot more photos than I used to because now with the internet and all that kind of stuff so we kind of jazz it up and get stats and do all kinds of stuff with it now so and then I send it there's a excellent guy he's uh, on the staff there and works with all the families so and he I email it to him and he prints it off and gets it to George the night before the game so and then he what he tells me, then he reads them on the bus going in, and that's kind of part of his first step in preparation on game day. So that's his little process, and I'm just grateful to be a part, for, part of it, and I still don't know at this stage, after all the games he's played and the people and things he's learned, that I have a whole lot to say to him, but he keeps telling me he still wants me to write them, so I'll keep writing them as long as he wants me to send them. I'd say uh, it's either, it depends on the bus ride. So if we have a long bus ride, I'll read it on the bus. Um, if it's a quick ride, then I usually save it. I get an IV before every game, so I usually do it right. I just write when I get to the stadium, I read it. Typically I'll review his last game a little bit, kind of score where we're at and all that. And I'm always looking at kind of the season, what he's doing himself. So, um, and again, a lot of it is, you know, me reminding him that he's really not that big of a deal, you know. Don't forget the weight room. Don't forget to watch film. Do the little things. Make sure you're working on your footwork, your all the little details that make you good. Because blocking in the NFL doesn't happen by accident. You know, it's it's technique. If you're not a good technician, you can't do it. And so um, that's why he's able to block some guys that are bigger and all that kind of stuff. So just trying to make sure he never forgets the foundation that got him to where he's at. And so that's a lot of the letters. So then I'll go through the last game a little bit, sometimes more than others. Um, in the early days, I would offer some suggestions and critiques because I record all the games and watch them all, and then some plays he plays well and some plays he doesn't play well. So, uh, And I'm sure he's getting all that from his coach. I do less of that anymore because he typically has been playing pretty good, so I don't do too much. Still got to work on some of his pass sets, but anyway, that's another story. So, uh, so we'll do that, and so a little bit on that, and then uh, I usually do some kind of mental piece. And so I use, you know, we're big Lord of the Rings fans. Between that, the Joker, maybe Harry Potter, I don't know, whatever. So just stuff that we've used over the years and I'll use any kind of those things and try to draw a little bit of a lesson, life lesson to think about and things to do that way. And then I'll review the next team 
So talk about whether it's the Rams or whoever and look at their stats, compare what that is, who the 49ers are, and talk about, you know, Coach Kittle's keys to the game and things that he needs to think about and do all that. And then always include a few pictures of family and that kind of stuff and just remind him that he's really loved. And every single game I tell him, this was Bob's stuff at Oklahoma, but uh, play hard, play fast, play smart, and be physical. You know, those four components. And I, I really believe in that. And then uh, my biggest underline for him is always to have fun. So we always talk about don't let the game ever take the fun part away because it's still a game, so have fun. And so we just try to, and then affirm him too. I guess the other part is, you know, I have a big belief that, you know, with the manifestation, the visualization that we work on, um, nothing that approaches him is too big for him because the, because of the use of his visualization, he's already experienced the game. So when you walk out into the Superdome and you've already been there and won it in your mind, all you got to do is go do it. George is all about routine and, I mean, you could say it's superstitious to some extent, but no, I knew that he would always want his dad to write him letters. So when Bruce said, I don't know what else I can offer him, I'm like, oh, you have a lot to offer, but it's more he, he expects that and he wants that. So, no, he'll, it'll, he'll keep writing as long as he's playing. So, yes, we are the 49ers. Yes, this is our history, and you Steelers are about to become part of our new history and tradition as this team we beat on our way to the playoffs. Oh, and by the way, we do not give a sh if you have six Lombardi trophies. The Pats just beat your ass, and so will we. So you can look at those when you get home with another loss with your tail between your legs, for we are the new 49ers, and we got your ass. Kind of makes you feel like you can go play, right? Makes you feel like you can win no matter what. Yeah, helps me every single week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.